Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Fort Worth Library. My name is Julia Stafford. I am a program coordinator for the library. I mainly handle exhibits and adult programs such as this. And I have been working with Doug Harmon, Clara Rudell, and Bob Holmes for several months now, bringing the Quanta Parker <coughs> exhibit to the library space right outside this door, as well as planning a number of programs through the exhibit in this space for you to learn more about Quanta Parker and Cynthia Ann and the Comanche history, especially in our area. I would like to say that tonight is actually a special event at the Central Library. This is the first program for the, the Quanta Parker series of programs which if you haven't already gotten one of these cards, please do take as many as you'd like. The front is generic information about the exhibit and programs, but the back has a full listing of all of the programs that we'll be hosting here throughout um, about mid-December. Please come and come as often as you'd like. Tonight at the Central Library is something we're calling a look-in. It's essentially an open house and it'll be going on through 8 p.m. So after this program this evening, feel free to mosey on throughout the rest of the building. There are a variety of events going on, um, including a cooking demonstration downstairs in our genealogy, local history and archives department. They're having short narratives and how to about how to research your family history and some of the resources we have there and a few other things for families as well. So please do feel free to take a, a look around. There are door prizes this evening for that event. When you come next week, that won't be here. So don't expect it every week. That's all from me. I'm gonna turn the program over to Doug Harmon, who will then introduce the program itself. Thank you so much again for being here. Actually, uh, Julia and the, and the library staff have been so wonderful, but uh, they have tolerated us uh, over these many, many weeks. And uh, we actually, if you see on, on how the things are, are uh, attached to the walls, or clips. Well, we actually exhausted the total number of clips they had ever used, ever ordered, uh, because of all the things that uh, we were able to bring to, to the library. Let me just give a few quick uh, kind of background notes about this exhibit and how we are here. And we, I'm, I'm just delighted that you are all here and, and interested in this, this subject. But um, I, just personally speaking, years ago, it was long, many, many decades ago when I was in Boy Scouts uh, in Nebraska, I went to a, uh, uh, the Winnebago uh, reservation area. And I came away just stunned uh, because I saw so much poverty at the at this reservation well many many years passed I actually uh, uh, dug uh, on a uh, Smithsonian a major dig on at the Oahe Dam in South Dakota and so I, I got another perspective on what on the uh, kind of the archaeology side of things but it was when I came here to be city manager in 85 is where I learned about Quanta Parker uh, I met uh, Ben Tomacara I met Lance uh, and over time, the, my curiosity about the Comanche Nation, uh, Native American issues generally, just increased, uh, you know, dramatically. And, and, and to this day, uh, I still have so many questions in my own mind. And I hope that what this uh, program, this presentation, which goes to December uh, 15th, uh, opens doors, uh, leads you to question a lot of things, to learn and to explore. Because I think in learning about the story about Quana and Cynthia Ann Parker, it raises a whole series of very important kinds of questions about uh, the indigenous people of the Americas, the relationship between those people and the settlers, uh, and as well as, and it's not in the program per se, but really the contemporary issues of how indigenous people, Native Americans, Comanches, uh, have been treated and the issues and challenges that uh, they, they have all faced. Well, anyway, that's just, uh, well then, 
get to how this specific exhibit began, uh, Claire Rudell standing over here, and she's going to introduce our wonderful speaker here in just a moment. Uh, but she's sort of the mother of this exhibit, you could say. Uh, she has, uh, uh, well, she worked at the Convention Visitor Bureau for a number of years, and before that was actually a nurse. Uh, the Convention Visitor Bureau certainly needed a nurse on staff because we had so many peculiar people there, uh, but the, uh, <laughs> including myself. But, the, but her specialty was in photography and, and uh, 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 historical research. And she, along with Bob Holmes up here, waving his hat, Fortunately, Bob is very tall because we needed a tall man to help put up all the exhibits. Uh, so anyway, the three of us came up with an idea of having an exhibit about Quana and Cynthia Ann. And that's about three years ago. And the black and white photos on the far wall, and this is actually one of them here and there's some up there, uh, were first put together by the three of us and shown at the UTA gallery in, in downtown uh, Fort Worth. And from that, the uh, Lakes Trail, the regional program, National uh, Historical Commission, uh, took that on. And this, that specific part of this exhibit has gone to about 16 places. So there's a whole other story about how different places uh, have handled all of this. The other sponsors, you know, clearly the library. I mean, we, I t one of the great things about this is that it, it reminds all of us of the wonderful resource we have here at the library. This, the, the gallery, this room, and, and the, the things that go on. So we're hoping that this will attract a lot of people here. But on the list across the way, the Mayor's Promotional Fund was one of the uh, major ones that uh, contributed uh, kind of the modest amount of money that allowed uh, us to put all of this together. Key thing, though, was when we discovered how much space we had here available, then we decided we really needed to take full advantage of it. So in this, we have a number of things borrowed uh, Lance and his families contributed a number of things uh, and loaned a number of things for this exhibit as well as a number of other friends. But also the uh, Worthington uh, Renaissance Hotel. Redstone Visual Images is the one, a company here in Fort Worth that created this, uh, this imagery. A really a great company, the Con uh, Fort Worth Convention Visitor Bureau. I mentioned the Lakes Trail, Texas Historical Commission, Friends of the Fort Worth Library, and also the Comanche Nation. The part of the exhibit out here came from the Comanche Nation, and if you look at that exhibit, you're going to learn a great deal about the Comanche Nation of today as well as in the, in the past. And finally, we're going to have a number of children come through here through Imagination Celebration. And th so the, the children's school part of this is really very, very important, and we really look forward to that. Well, with that, one last thing. Uh, if you have a phone, at least put it on mild vibrate. Uh, just if, uh, you know, we don't want to have anybody uh, get all uh, upset with the phone going off with all those weird ringing, ringing tones. But let me introduce the mother of the exhibit. Claire Rudell is going to introduce our speaker, and she and Bob have been just wonderful to work with, and we're just so pleased we can share this with you. Clara. No, this is all Doug's fault because when I worked for him at the CVB, he would always say, well, Claire, let's plan this. Claire, let's plan that. Somebody's already violated. Oh, <laughs> wife, Judy. oh. <laughs> Judy, you're, you're caught. And it's a call from you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I will be very brief. It has been a real pleasure to uh, participate as a co-organizer of this uh, exhibit. And it's my pleasure to introduce Meg Hacker. Um, I got chosen to be program chairman, which is one thing I love to do because we know lots of speakers. And one of the first people, one of the first books I ever read about Cynthia Ann Parker was Meg Hacker's book. And so I always had her in mind, and she was one of the first ones I chose to be a speaker tonight. Uh, Meg is director of the archives, the National Archives at Fort Worth, and she's going to be sharing a lot of information. You got a treasure trove in our own back door, and even I didn't know it for a long time. But now she's stuck with me coming down uh, almost monthly. Uh, Meg uh, is a uh, researcher, a writer, an author, and she has now found the portals of Texas. So she's decided she's going to rewrite this wonderful book. Now, I don't know how in the world she can improve upon it, but it is for sale in all the uh, bookstores. So if you get a chance, go and buy it. So without further uh, wording, I'll introduce Meg Hacker. All right. 
Can everybody hear me if I don't speak into the microphone? Yes. Yay. Um, well, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys so much for inviting me to come help celebrate the life and legend of Cynthia Ann and her son, Quana. Um, I did write the little book, I have to admit, but it was because I went to Austin College and I was given an opportunity to write an honors thesis. The beauty of it, it was that they said, you can pick any topic you want. And so I said, okay, all right. I love Texas history. I love women's history. So I'll write a biography about someone. <clears throat> so I offered to my professor, like Cummings, how about Janice Joplin? <laughs> oh, uh, so I said, oh, I get a tr second choice, don't I? And he said, yes. And uh, so what I did is I found the notable, the book on notable Texas women. I went into the index, no joke. I closed my eyes, I ruffled through the index, went up and down, up and down and landed on Cynthia Ann Parker. There's no other scientific way to explain how I selected her other than that. And I couldn't have been happier. Doing just a little bit of research in just a few seconds, uh, well, in a little while, and I found how little there was of factual information on Cynthia Ann out there. So I thought, all right, I love Nancy Drew. I liked Agatha Christie. Put on my detective hat, and we're gonna start finding some of the truth that is out there. And that is why my book is so small. <laughs> so uh, it is nonfiction. I tried to keep, there's so much legend. There's so many stories about her, but what part of it is true? So stripping it down, that's where we get our stories. So I'm going to take you for the next uh, several minutes or so through a little bit of history and as uh, Clara said, I've been bitten by the portal to Texas history bug. If you have not played on that site, it's free. It is, it is very addicting. Uh, from a historian's perspective, from a genealogist's perspective, just from a detective's perspective, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I will go through a few of the other sites as well. Um, all right, she told me to be patient. Okay, um, I'm gonna stand up here a little bit. Uh, several of the uh, sites that are at your fingertips. Most of them are free, and if they're not free, you can get them free by visiting the National Archives over here in Montgomery Plaza, uh, or downstairs in the archives here, because Ancestry and Poll3, uh, they have institutional memberships at both facilities, and they're free at your fingertips. So I encourage you to take a look at all these sites, Every single one of them has something to do with the Parker family in some form or fashion, some more so than others. And this is not inclusive, it's just what I could fit on the screen. So I had a lot of fun. Okay, one of the earliest things I found uh, to show that uh, Cynthia Ann Parker's family was alive and well and actually was a reality, uh, was on the 1830 federal population census. Found her father, Silas Parker. He has all these little widgets next to him, which means uh, these are the three white persons included in the family, including the head of household. Um, there's one male under five, that I believe is her brother John. One male between 15 and 20, I do not know who that would be. One male between 20 and 30, that's most likely Silas. One female under five, that's most likely Cynthia Ann and one female between 20 and 30, and that would be her mother, Lucy. So she exists. <laughs> and you'll see a bunch of those names, Duty and Ingram, and, so, and uh, you'll find their names very similar, that everywhere they live, their friends, their families tended to live nearby. If you haven't been out to Fort Parker's site, it's, a, it's an interesting site. It's a good day trip from here. Uh, at Christmas time, I think they have Christmas at Fort Parker. Um, it's a, it, it puts it in the whole story into perspective as well. Well, in the 1830s, Texas settlers, obviously, um, through history as we know, had some issues with the various tribes, and it was vice versa as well. The tribes weren't real thrilled that the settlers were here. The settlers weren't thrilled that they, uh, um, that the Comanches and the Caddo's and other tribes were there. And on more than one occasion, the Parker family thought, well, maybe we should check this and move somewhere else. 
but they persevered and they stayed where they are. How many of y'all have been to the Parker site? It's pretty remote. You have to get there. You don't just find it accidentally, do you? It's those destination uh, trips. But you can see how isolated it is. And so when they had, and the actual site I think is um, not on the original site. It's been moved, but not by much. Well, they often would keep the family, because it gets a little hot out there, they would keep the big gate open so there'd be some circulation inside the courtyard inside uh, the compound. Uh, they were very safety conscious, but they were also hot. <laughs> so they had to open it for some ventilation. Um, typical Comanche camp at the time would resemble something similar to this. Uh, and often they were targeted by the army as well as Silas Parker, Cynthia's father, and other people like him. Um, and women and children were often the casualties of these aggressive campaigns. I found this letter at Old Fort Parker, and, um, and it's from Silas Parker. Uh, he's writing to the General Council of Texas, and he says in there, I've taken the, li the responsibility on myself to instruct the office of uh, uh, officers to pursue a fresh Indian trail that has been made by late depredators. This is very typical of what many families would do. They would find a trail of somebody who has uh, antagonized them in some form or fashion and they're going to go after them. The problem also is that many of the tribes and the camps that they did find along the way were peaceful and had nothing to do with the aggressions. And, but in uh, Silas Parker's eyes, there was no difference. And that caused a lot of animosity, even more so against the Parker family. So you have to question, did he have anything to help instigate the raid, to be a cause factor in the raid? All right, so in the spring of 1836, neighbors of the Parkers said that there was a large gathering along the Trinity River of Indians. Uh, nobody did anything with this information to our knowledge. There's nothing written down that would say so. But on May 26, 1836, a group of uh, uh, Indians approached Fort Parker. Benjamin Parker went out there to talk. That's Cynthia Ann's uh, uncle. And he's instantly killed. Uh, the, di the situation, ironically, um, was that the men were all out at the fields. It was mostly women and children inside the fort. But somebody ran out to alert the men in the fields that this attack is going on. They come back. And the five people killed Silas, her father, John Parker, the grandfather, who was the patriarch of the family, Benjamin, the uncle, and Samuel and Robert Frost. Robert was a young teenager, I believe. So, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a good day. Um, <laughs> So, but there's lots of mayhem because people scattered everywhere. They left the, the fort, they came, uh, people scattered along the river. They didn't know when it was going to be safe to come out. And so after a while, they finally had to reassess. They, they figured out that now's a safe time to come out and count the wounded, count the casualties. And they came across five people missing, Elizabeth Kellogg, Rachel Parker Plummer, James Pratt Plummer, which is Rachel's young infant son or two-year-old son, John Parker, and Cynthia Ann, brother and sister. The survivors start to reassess. Some move away, and they don't come back. Others move nearby, and others, I just have no clue what happened to them. Um, but James Parker, which is Rachel's father, and Cynthia Ann's uncle immediately, immediately starts looking for his daughter and his grandson and the other captives. As far as we know, Cynthia Ann's mother is out of the picture. I, I, maybe she's assuming James is, or worse, I'm assuming James is working on her behalf, but you really don't find her anywhere in the papers after this. Um, James Parker is adamant. He is going to find his daughter and grandson no matter what. And he really does work hard. He is exhausted after years. He's financially exhausted. He's physically exhausted and mentally trying to find everyone. Rachel, I mean, Elizabeth Kellogg is ransomed within three months after the raid. Rachel Parker Plummer takes on a very 
interesting but very sad life. She's about 19, we think, at this time. It turns out she's pregnant. Uh, and, oh, don't listen to this part. Um, it gets, so she has a very, very difficult time with the uh, tribes. She is instantly enslaved. She's viewed as a slave. Um, and she's treated as a slave. Uh, she does give birth. The baby does distract her. And, and the baby goes away. You'll have to read the narrative to find out how. But it's not pretty. Um, and so Rachel is distraught. But a few months later, she is ransomed out in New Mexico. And she gets home, and she writes down everything that happens. And in this memoir that she has created, it is riveting. You read every word. Every page is very riveting. Um, she dies one year later. So uh, she never reunites with her young son. She never, nothing is ever mentioned about her husband, Luther. Um, and so she dies with, at her father's home. I encourage you to find this memoir. It is a very, very interesting, it's called the Rachel Plummer Memoir. Uh, I wish I had a more creative name, but that's it. Um, a year after she dies, her father edits it and changes it. So you want to make sure, make sure you read the first version. The second version is a little different from it. Um, he, he inserts a, a lot of, uh, of religion into it. Uh, God's domain took him this way and that way, whereas Rachel, she called it just exactly how it was. Okay, and in, in 1843, one of my reasons I love Portal of Texas, I found this on Saturday. I couldn't believe it. They just start publishing excerpts of her memoir on Portal of Texas. And so all you have to do is when you get to the Portal of Texas, type in your topic. Type in the name you're researching. Type in, yeah, and you can narrow it down to dates. So uh, I did several searches, some just on Parker's in 1836. I didn't find much except an allusion to a relief uh, law or a relief bill that the Parker family was asking because of the disaster of the massacre. But in 1843, I start finding here, where is my poor little James Pratt? Whoever has read the exciting narrative of Rachel Plummer uh, uh, counting the, the accounts in the capture of herself and others by the Comanches, um, and it goes on and on. But in 1843, Rachel's already dead. We know that. She died in 1839, I believe. Um, but she had never did see her son, James Pratt. Over here in the last paragraph on it, it does say, John Parker and James Pratt Plummer were purchased by, from the Comanches by the Delawares, and then by the Delawares by a commanding officer at Fort Gibson. We've got a paper trail. Now we can start looking to see, maybe <coughs> did this really happen? What happened? And it says they spoke in perfect English, especially the elder boy, which I, uh, is John Parker. Uh, both of them seemed to enjoy fine health and were quite uh, communicative. John Parker stated he had been in 16 battles, had been shot three times. James told a little girl in town that John was married to a white woman who was still a captive to, an, to the Indians and that he, John, intended to go back and get her after a while. All right, legend is starting. And the stories and the myths are starting here. So I found in 1845, online, in an auction, uh, the actual treasury warrant for John Parker that was issued to Isaac to get the rent, to pay for the purchase of John Parker. I didn't find it for James Pratt. Maybe it's out there. It went for $2,500. And it's a little, little piece of paper. Um, and so here we have proof John Parker was purchased, was ransomed from the Indians, and was returned home. Or do we? <laughs> OK. My only sighting of Lucy Parker since the uh, 1836 raid is she is listed on the Texas census for the tax list in 1846 in nearby Grimes County, 
that's it. I did find um, one piece of paper at Fort Sill that said Lucy Parker married some guy named Ulry, and that was it. So I started looking for Ulrys, and there are lots of Ulrys on the same census page as Parker's, but I never found a Lucy Ulry. Um, but this is it. So she is still alive, but she's very quiet. Um, Here's a sighting that was from these two guys who were sent around uh, named Butler and Lewis. And they were going around at, for the Secretary of War, talking to Indians. It's a huge, long letter. They called it a letter. Uh, but it's a report. They go around and they're talking to various tribes. They're talking uh, for, on, on behalf of the government, trying to figure out uh, ways to better the Indian-white relations. And they happen upon Cynthia Ann in one of the tribes. Now this is 1847. She's now about 20 years old. Um, and he finds her. And he recognizes that she is this white woman. He talks to him. Indeed, she is Cynthia Ann Parker. Uh, Butler and Lewis say to um, them, well, can we purchase her? We've got all this money. We've got these blankets. We've got this, that, and the other. Can't we have her? And they said, no. We're, we're fine, and you can't have her. But there's this written into this report, the actual sighting of Cynthia Ann. It's the only one we've got in the, in the government situation. It is, I found it gave credit to the Republic Museum in Washington, Texas, the star of the Republic. Um, moving on to 1850, the families are still here. Not many of them have left. Luther Plummer, Rachel Plummer's father, I mean husband, um, is living in Limestone County and he has four more children that would all be, had to be a second wife. Uh, there's no wife mentioned, but he's still in existence and he's, but he's not living anywhere near the Parker family. So I think he's been kind of ostracized. There's been some uh, reports I've read where he was kind of a ne'er-do-well kind of a person and so there was no real great uh, desire to go to for Rachel to go back to him in fact by the time she was ransomed there's also talk that he had already remarried so that he didn't wait long um, but here he is alive and well in here I'll go I'll let you do it um, I also found in the same census in a nearby county in Anderson Silas and Orlina Cynthia Ann's brother and sister they are not living with Lucy which is interesting to me. They are living with the duties and the Anglins. All these families who were part of Fort Parker and lived at Fort Parker, and they're taking care of Silas and Orlina. So there's a little bit of mystery, history's mysteries as to why that's taking place. Why aren't they with their mother? Um, and why isn't she listed anywhere else? Okay, the next one. Um, so we'll go back to some Indian white relations. Uh, in 1854, uh, 12 leagues of land in the upper big Wichita and Brazos rivers were set aside for a Comanche reservation. And they were, the government was saying, hey, come on down, any of you, we're going to put you on a reservation. Well, the Comanches said, yeah, we're not interested. Uh, but some tribes, some remnant tribes were starving and they went in to the reservation. Indian white relations were so stressed at this time. Uh, so even on the reservation was not a good thing uh, for either races. And so there was constant fighting, constant problems. In the late 1850s, it didn't help that John Baylor, who had been fired by the Office of Indian Affairs, um, claimed that the Comanches and, and other tribes were committing more problems in North Central Texas. And what Baylor did was he emotionalized everybody. and especially those who had lost relatives or property, and appealed to all sorts of frontiersmen to kill the Indians. Kill Indians, not just any, but all. And he aroused the settlers to the point that they would attack the reservationists and kill or drive away the Indians. That's why when people come to the archives and they say, oh, my family uh, lived on the reservations in Texas. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Um, they weren't here very long, and which tribes? And if they say Cherokee, I know they're wrong. Um, so the Comanche 
were only here for a very short time on the reservation before it was moved up to Oklahoma. And that was for the safety of all parties involved. But it didn't help with Baylor stirring things up to have them being points of con uh, attacks. Okay. Um, another brilliant portal um, is the Texas Almanac. I never thought of it being around in 1859, and nor did I even dream that it would be digitized and free to my fingertips. So I started to um, look there, and sure enough, it had a section on Cynthia Ann and her family. And this is 1859, so it's still, she has not been brought back. And it does talk about Elizabeth Kellogg Plum and Rachel Plummer and John Parker and Cynthia Ann. But no, in the Texas Almanac in 59, they say John Parker hasn't been returned from the Indians. So wait a minute, we had that warrant that said he was ransomed, but then we have all these other accounts that say he stayed with the Comanches, he's not back yet. So we still have some, lots of inconsistencies in their history as what's being presented. But it reads very well. I encourage you guys to take a look at the, the Texas Almanac. And again, look at, for your own community and your own historical research and your own families, you'd be surprised at what they put into the Almanac even back in 1859. Okay, next one. Um, so letting my fingers do the walking, this is out of Ancestry 1860. Um, I have found on here her youngest brother Silas, he's now a grown man and he's got a family and they're in Van Zandt County. Kind of all sticking around the same area but their movement and they're still around. Okay, the next one. Um, meanwhile, back on the frontier, um, going back and forth showing you these circles, these spheres of things that are happening all at once. You got the Texas Rangers going. Well, they're not paid very well. There's a very interesting book by Gary Anderson um, that if you might be interested in reading um, and on the, on the Rangers. Uh, but he talks about the early Rangers, the early ones. They weren't paid well. They were viewed as above the law, that they could do whatever they wanted, and they took to hunting Indians to be a sport, not a military. Uh, endeavor in any way, shape, or form. That's mulling around. So we've got these, all these spears happening. Next one. Um, so then we have Sol Ross. In December 1860, he has his real <laughs> rangers, and now these other frontiersmen who call themselves rangers, um, all together, and they spot an Indian camp near uh, ca uh, not Cash, well, near um, Wichita Falls. And so he thinks he's got it made. He's got his men here. He sees the camp. He makes his plans. And it's very obvious the camp is not aware of what is happening. Okay. Um, and in his own words, he says, the Indians were unconscious of our presence and had gotten out on a level plain and were never apprised of our approach until we were within 200 yards of them in full charge, consequently killing many of them before they could even make any preparation for defense. This part right here, all stories agree on. And then the stories separate. So what happened? Um, well, Sol Ross thinks he killed Peter Nakona. He thinks all these warriors were there. Uh, most of the other stories say this was women and children only. The men were out on a hunting mission, and only invalid and the elderly were there. So uh, when they annihilated most of the people there, they annihilated women, children, elderly men, and women. Uh, there's, there, the number of killed wavers from 20 to 250. Depends who's telling the story as to what's happening. Um, the fact of the matter is there were only three survivors out of this camp. So whether they killed a small camp or a large camp, only three survivors. And one is this young boy that I found uh, just fairly recently, and he was captured there at the river, uh, at Pease River Massacre uh, by Sol Ross, and then Sol actually adopts him 
names them Pease after the river, and he's Pease Ross. Um, I know very little about him after this. Uh, I can't find him hardly anywhere. My trails run dry. Um, but it's an interesting story because not, not less than 10 years earlier, Sol Ross in another uh, battle uh, finds a white woman, a young white child in the camp and he decides uh, after he tried to find who, who she belonged to and he couldn't, he adopted her and named her Lizzie after his wife. So he has two adopted refugees of battles that he, partook, he was involved in. But I know nothing about either of them as to what happens afterwards. But what is interesting as well is that now you have in this battle is Cynthia Ann. So she is riding with her child, her two-year-old, in her lap. And the stories all vary at this point. So they say, are you, uh, she's, she's running, she's on this horse, they kill the horse, they're about to kill her, and somebody says, oh wait, you can't kill her, she has blue eyes, she must be a white woman. I have brown eyes, I would have been killed, I guess. So, um, so they say, oh wait, wait, we can't do this, you can't kill a blue-eyed person. So there they stop, and they take her and take more notice to her. Notice that she has blonde hair, this young infant in her arms, and they take her uh, to Camp Cooper and a couple other places for, um, to be interrogated, to be interviewed, to find out who she is and what is she, and why is she there. So the only fact that we really have about the Pease River Massacre, and I really do use the word massacre on it because that's what it was, only three people survived, pure and simple. Okay, next one. Uh, in her uh, running, you'll see this photo out there, actually in a much better photograph than this one. Um, this is at the Science and History Museum. This is supposedly the buffalo robe that Cynthia was wearing when she was captured uh, at the Pease River. Um, and so they said uh, they would uh, put her now in Western wear. She was supposed to be a white woman, so they took away her clothes, but the family kept the, the robe and after years donated it to the Science and History Museum. But it's fascinating, it's a much better photo, so take a look at the exhibit out there. Okay, next. Newspapers go nuts now. 1860 with this big um, uh, battle at Pease River, and now just two months later, the stories start coming in and they are flying. And they're saying the woman who was captured by Sol Ross's company in an engagement with the Indians proved to be the niece of Colonel Isaac Parker of Tarrant County. And upon interrogation um, by, at Camp Cooper by Parker and others, the white man says she, the white man and others, the white man, says she spoke as follows. Um, and, she re and she tells this detailed story. I remember when I was a little girl being a long time at a house with a picket fence all around. Well, you saw the pictures. It's a tall picket fence. Um, one day some Indians came to the house. They had a white rag on a stick. My father went out to talk to them. They surrounded and killed him. Then many other Indians came and fought at the house. Several whites were killed. My mother and her four children were taken prisoners. In the evening, mother and two of her children were retaken by a white man. I had never read that before. I had never seen that. So again, thank you to the portal. You know, you've got a new insight into the raid. Uh, my cousin was taken with me and was sold afterwards. My brother died among the Indians uh, north of Santa Fe. So with sp uh, smallpox. All right, so now we have another story about John Parker. It just keeps going. Um, the three of the children, uh, she has three of the children, she has three children, two of them uh, were at home, meaning out in the uh, um, area of, of Peace River, and she's with her daughter, Topsana um, Prairie Flower. And it goes on and on. But it is a fascinating story. Now you have to take into consideration, this is Comanche. She hasn't spoken 
English in you know, many a decade. The interpretation could be shaky, but she's gotten some pretty good points there that, that are spot on. Okay. Uh, Galveston News picks up on it, and they're saying now this is uh, a month later, March, and they're asking for relief for Cynthia Ann. So they're asking for some money for her. They want some acreage for her, and they want some uh, uh, pension for all her suffering that she had to endure over the years. And again, they repeat the stories. The stories, the history is now getting a little liquidy uh, as you look in the details. But still, it reads just like a, a novel. Okay. Um, the bill is for a league of land um, and $100 a year. Now, the deal is, look at this. 1863 is when it's finally approved. Well, I never hear anything about it. Did she get the land? Did she get the money? What happened? What happened? Well, years later, Quanah made the same questions. And they said, oh, this was made when we were a Confederate state, and any promises that were made then <laughs> are null and void. So there, is, there was no money, and there was no uh, pension. Um, and so they just said, yes, it's going to take effect any second. Never did. Okay. Um, 1870 census. This was pivotal in my research, because every book said Cynthia Ann died shortly after being recaptured by the whites returned to her family. Uh, her daughter dies and she suffers uh, greatly from all the, ho the horror that she's had to endure. She's lost her husband, her children, and now her daughter that was with her. So she has no reason to live. It's all these romanticized stories. And she quits eating. She suffers from uh, self-induced starvation and dies from la grip. Very interesting, kind of highly fun, uh, well not fun, but sensationalized reading. So I ended my book with that. And I thought, you know, I work for the National Archives. We got the census. I should just see, because one or two little spotty sources said 70. She, was, she died in 1870. So I really just reluctantly looked on the 1870 census and I'll be damned, there she was. <laughs> I was so shocked. And not only was she there, she's alive and housekeeping with her sister, Ophelia, and, or Lena, I mean. And um, now the census, if many of you use the federal population census, you can use the age with a grain of salt. Sometimes even the sex, you know, is a little bit of iffy. Um, but you don't put a dead woman on the census years later. So I think pretty much the, the idea that she died in 1864, 1866 are gone. She's alive and well in 1870. But through all my research, I never ever once saw an obituary. Here you got papers full of her coming back, full of her getting uh, photographed in uh, Fort Worth, full of going down to Austin and almost being paraded through the town, but then nothing. So what happened to her? When did she die? I looked on the 1880s. She's not there. Kwana surrenders in 1875, and the first things he does, the very first things, is that he looks into what happened to his mom. Where is she? He puts out ads and papers, and he finds out she died in 1870. This is it. Well, why isn't there? I mean, if I can find out Aunt M Mildred from Cincinnati is visiting, you know, somebody on page three, why aren't they putting the, you know, Cynthia Ann Parker, this frontier legend, died? It's just not there. So, but she is alive in 1870. Um, she's buried in Fosterville Cemetery in Anderson County. And everybody notes the size of her hands in this image. Uh, she was a very hard worker. She could tide hand, uh, she could hand hides very well. She was an incredible worker. Um, doesn't look very happy here, uh, but she was a strong, strong woman. Okay. Um, so I said, uh, Quana surrenders. He moves his uh, uh, band uh, to Oklahoma. And part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's records is that they have some incredible, incredible tribal 
roles. And I encourage you to look at them. Uh, well, I picked this one for a variety of reasons, but this is 1885 Comanches. You've got the Indian name and the English name. When I've done my research on Kwana, you have translations on the English, everything relating to the sense of smell. You have odor. I've seen sweet smelling, fragrance, perfume, stench, foul, everything that was the whole gamut of scents. So I don't know if that was the interpreter didn't like them that day. Uh, and that, then it was negative if they were friends, made it positive, or if it was the interpretation. But, and so maybe you guys can tell me, because the, but the one thing that is totally geared is that it's about the scent of smell. Okay, um, then another brilliant breakthrough. This one was on uh, the Library of Congress's page, the Humanities Project, which is Historic American Newspapers. I, not the same newspapers that were in the portal, different, wonderful. This is not in as good a shape as the portal, but uh, I'll take it where I can. After my book was published, and this was in 1990, many years ago, so I didn't have email, I didn't have computers, um, the whole thing was typed on a Selectric. <laughs> Thank goodness for the corrector tape. Um, so my phone rang and a person from Louisiana was calling me, long distance, day rate, and, um, <laughs> and they said, I'm a direct descendant of Prairie Flower, of Topsana. And I'm like, well, she died early. Um, you know, even in the Book of Guinness Records, I don't think it was possible. So, um, but he told me, he said that the whites really viewed Cynthia Ann as an unfit mother. And so they told Cynthia Ann that her daughter died, but they took her away and sent her to Louisiana to be raised by distant family members. Um, I guess it was plausible. I mean, I don't have any proof. I didn't have anything, but he was adamant. I said, do you have any papers? Do you have anything? No, nothing. So I said, well, thank you for the interesting story. And about six months later, the phone rang again. Same exact story, except New Mexico was the destination. He said, I'm a direct descendant of Topsana. Um, my family's very proud of that. Uh, and, I, and I just was sorry you didn't put that in your book. And I was like, well, I'm really sorry I didn't know about it. Um, but do you have any proof? No. I'm like, well, now what? So I had two exact identical stories that Topsana was removed from Cynthia Ann's care taken to someone else to be raised, and these two families who I did ask if they were related, they'd never heard of each other. Well then, the Chronicling America, historic, uh, the Library of Congress's uh, 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 digitized newspapers, I found one out of El Paso that states that Quana is going to the Mescalero Apache area to go get his long lost sister. Oh man, maybe there was some truth to that. I found this on Saturday, so I had no news for this, so it ends right here. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it's just that this, the story of Cynthia Ann is still unfolding. It's still out there. It's not a complete story yet. We're, we're still finding it. I never did find the obit, but I think, and there were about five, maybe even six newspapers saying the same thing. He's going to the Mescalero Apache tribe to collect his long lost sister. So then, um, I remembered in my research on Quana, he does go to uh, the Mescalero Apache reservation in the late 1800s, but I thought was to go gather Comanche slaves that the Apaches had, had stolen uh, from the Comanches and he wanted to go bring them back. In fact, there are letters in uh, the adjutant general's office saying he's doing exactly that. So I thought, well, are they getting it mixed up? Is this, but when the same, the different newspapers, not the exact same article, but they're all saying the same thing. And he's got the papers to prove it. He's, he's traveling with papers. Um, so I don't know where that ends, but I think that's a new, a new mystery. Okay, next one. Also I found in the same one is that the photo that you see of Cynthia Ann uh, with the baby at, with Topsana at her breast, 
was made into a um, painting and was being on display at the New Orleans World's exhibit. I thought that I, another intriguing mystery. I was like, how was it? How was it shown? What was it there for? What other paintings were out there? But they made it quite clear. And this covered a multitude of newspapers. This made everybody's newspaper that Cynthia Ann Parker's painting is going to be displayed at the World Exposition. Okay. Quana, um, I found some incredible editorials on Quana. What an, what an incredible man. Um, I like some of the comments that they made. Uh, he's the, his romantic history, everything is romantic. Um, he is 36 years old and by far the most influential man in the Comanche Nation. He is well-to-do, intelligent, and liberal, and a fast friend of the whites. Unfortunately, the next part of this was how um, he blew out the kerosene lantern downtown, <laughs> and that was not as a very good situation. Um, but they, they love him. Everything is praising Quana at this point. Next one. Um, and people are now, you know, this is almost 30 years later after the uh, raid on uh, the Peace River Massacre, and people are writing their memoirs. They're deciding, okay, and they're publishing them. So there's countless, countless stories of this. Now, I have a hard time remembering what I ate for breakfast this morning. So 30 years ago, to recount this, uh, it, you have to take with a grain of salt or, or very carefully as you dissect it because sometimes your memory remembers glorified memories. Some of them are spot on, but you don't know. So, but there are wonderful uh, tales of what's happening here and they even call it romance of history. I want to know what the, 18th, uh, the 19th century definition of romance is because they use it a lot. Um, okay, next one. Um, this was, I, I just love the photo, um, and out of the Fort Worth Gazette, they said, uh, this was another, another good uh, article, I think, a uh, young kid uh, named Dick Harbolt, and he's the brother of Jim Harbolt, who was the terror of the Arbuckle Mountains, actually stole one of Quanah's horses, and it went to court. And I thought, well, all right, I'm an archivist, I can find this, but I just found this out on Saturday, so I don't have any new news. But somebody stealing from it made the papers all over. And then I thought, oh, what a brazen little guy. He's, he's stolen um, from Quana, and it did go to court. So unfortunately, the Paris court had a little fire, and uh, the records have been destroyed. But there might be another newspaper account, I'm not sure. So OK, next. Um, another, this image, I believe, is out there. Um, another. Uh, I guess editorial, it, this one out of St. Paul, Minnesota, so it's making the rounds. Uh, it says he's unquestionably the wisest and the most progressive and the most advanced chief the Comanches ever had. This is undoubtedly due to the inheritance of his mother's intelligence. <laughs> Don't we all take a claim on our kids' intelligence? The Comanches have always been noted for their fierceness, their intrepid bravery, and the love of war. They've always been the best writers among all Indian tribes and have always demanded a chief who would uh, lead out the savage characteristics in them. Very interesting. This is 1890. So, and again, St. Paul, he, he, he's notorious. He is well known throughout the country. <coughs> okay. um, well, in 1910, he received some money to uh, move Cynthia Ann, have her in turn uh, and reburied up in cash. So I was looking for newspaper articles about this. Son of a gun. Finally I find a date. And this is out of the Palestine Herald in 1910 when she's removed and reburied in cash. Um, and it says she died in 1873. So now I have a, I just found this uh, Monday. <laughs> so um, I'm excited because now maybe I can find a death day. I don't know why that is so important to me, but I think the absence of it just bewilders me. So he, she's moved um, and to be reinterred near, near Quana. Okay. Um, this is a photo from the actual reburial of uh, Cynthia Ann. I was surprised I found that. Um, 
Uh, Quana spoke at her burial and he said, my mother was a good woman whom I always cherished. She's gone to her resting place. I myself may die at any minute, at any time. When I do, I want to meet my mother in the great beyond. That was nice, from a mother's perspective. That's a, that's a good sign. Um, but it was very touching. Everything, he gave a long uh, uh, speech at the service and it was very, very touching. Okay. Now, I can show you some of my favorite little things. Google News, if you haven't played with Google News, if you type in Google News, like where you have Google Maps, there's a tab for news. If you type in Quanta Parker or Cynthia Ann, you're gonna get Bud Kennedy's article from last week. But in the left column, you can customize it to go way back to 1836 even, or 1850s, or anywhere in the 19th century, and hit enter, and you'd be amazed at what comes up. And so here he's going after, uh, he's helping, Geronimo runs away, and he tries to go to Arizona. So uh, they ask uh, Quana to, to help bring him back. Um, here's a, a, a more of uh, President Roosevelt's hunting trips with him. Little different versions of snippets, and then you click on it, you get the whole article. Very cool, indeed. Okay, next one. Uh, Parker Fort, you gotta go, if you haven't been, if you've just been as a spectator, see if they still have some of the research services that they used to have back in the early 1980s when I used them. But I found their letters very intriguing and very helpful, okay? Um, this is probably the, the, the spawn of the mysteries of Cynthia Ann and Quanta. James DeShield's book, was the only one, it was, uh, I believe, 1881, 82, somewhere in the early 80s, and he writes on her. But here he kind of glorified and made up a couple of things, but some things were spot on and others were way off. Uh, I can't afford this. I haven't received one from my husband yet for my birthday or anything, but uh, it's an expensive little book, usually found in the rare book division. Um, I used mine at Austin College, and it was uh, very illuminating. Um, next one. And then Ride the Wind. If you, I, I purposely did not read this during my research because I did not want it to cloud my nonfiction part of my brain. But after it was all said and done, I read it. It was, it was, it was fun, and it's been translated German. A lot of the uh, books that are relating to Native Americans, uh, the Germans eat up and they have them translated quite a bit. Okay, next. Um, Cynthia Ann, Sunshine on the Prairie, you've seen these, okay. Um, more books that are available, go ahead. Um, these are more recent, okay. Um, the Searchers. Uh, made because of Cynthia Ann. There's a, a guy, who, a journalist who's now at UT, he was at Stanford, who's writing a new <coughs> book on Quana and based on, well, and Cynthia Ann, based on the searcher's perspective. He got so excited when he started researching it and now it's become um, many years in making, but it's supposed to be out, I think, in the next year or two. Okay. Um, Oh, Larry Gatlin wrote a musical on the life of Quana at UT. I missed it uh, in 2005. I didn't get to see it. Um, but then the next one, go ahead. He wasn't the first. There's an opera about Cynthia Ann at the University of North Texas. So um, well, it was North Texas State Teachers back in 1939. Um, I'd like to see the remake. Um, okay, next. There are Lesson plans galore at your fingertips. Just let your fingertips go if you need something for a school or something. There are lots of questions and activities on Quana and, and Comanches, okay? Uh, Reenactors, um, and you're gonna have one next week. Couple, one of your programs is reenactor. Not this woman, but another one. Um, go ahead. Fine art you find on, on the internet. Her, her legacy goes everywhere. Um, there's even a beautiful iris named after her. And, and on Etsy, you can get this lovely medallion. Um, but I think, okay, next. Um, find a grave, 
Lots of people leave their comments on Cynthia Ann's grave uh, uh, on the internet, not literally. Um, so, and they're constantly being updated, okay? But my favorite is Texas Monthly Magazine named Cynthia Ann the best Indian <laughs> captain. <laughs> I did not know that. I didn't know we had a, a vote. Um, but she is Texas best Indian captain. Um, okay, next. Uh, usually wherever I go, there's someone related. Um, and, uh, so, and I can help you uh, with research if you need be at the National Archives. You can do it right downstairs here. Uh, the genealogy section here is very helpful, very wonderful people. We're just as nice at the archives. Um, I did put out there a little flyer on our facility at Montgomery Plaza. And also there's so much you can do on, on tracing and researching uh, Native American background online now. And I put a little, what I call a cheat sheet. So much of it's on Ancestry, Fold3, Family Search, and other areas. Uh, very, very, um, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's not easy. I won't lie to you. Uh, but it, but the deep, my instruction sheet is. Um, so, but if you do any research, please let us know if we can help you in any way. Uh, we're here to help you. I hope you enjoyed tripping through history with me with uh, Cynthia Ann Parker Revisited. And I wish you the best of your <laughs>61, I believe. Okay. Yeah, it was early. About 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing was the gravestone that you showed had her death in 1870. You're, you said 1873 from that. Well, 1870 is what I've seen. 1873 is what I just found on Saturday or Monday. I forget now. Mm -hmm. Just in the last few days, an article saying she died in 1873. I cannot find, like, March 21st, you know, or any Same. specific dates. Nothing. That would support your census. Uh, Interested in 1873. Right. So, right. Well, I, Meg, thank you very oh, much. Oh, my pleasure. I tell you. Uh, she knows how to make uh, the study of history really interesting. And we have here, both in the library as well as at the archives, incredible resources. And uh, uh, I know Judy, my wife, uh, at, I mean, Research, researching her family, not Native American family, it's just absolutely fascinating. So I hope this, this stirs a lot of interest in, in pursuing those things. We invite you back first, certainly, to see the exhibit. Look at the other programs that are listed, because we go through a whole series. The last one is on how uh, Native Americans uh, have participated in and been portrayed in movies. So in that one, it's really in terms of how popular culture and everything in between. And, and Lance, when Lance speaks, uh, I think it's another a really important uh, perspective in terms of families in the Comanche Nation. So we're very excited about this. I think uh, we're all learning a lot and uh, just so pleased that you're here. And if you have any questions or suggestions, please pass it to, uh, to Clara, Bob, and myself. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you.